Welcome to Opening Up, an introduction to OER, OA, and Creative Commons licensing. This presentation by Alicia Lynam Bowen is licensed under Creative Commons version 4.0. Feel free to share, reshare, remix, revise, and do whatever you like, y'all. In this video, we will learn about open access, or OA, discuss open educational resources, also known as OER, review the history of Creative Commons as an organization, a set of licenses, and a movement, cover the basics of copyright in higher education, and finally, we will explore Creative Commons licenses that you may choose to use with your resources as you explore open educational resources. Open access is a movement to make information, particularly academic research, free and openly available to all. Open access publications can be downloaded, shared, distributed, and searched at no cost to the user, no matter their affiliation with any individual institution. Advocates for open access are particularly opposed to public grant money being used for research that is then published in subscription-based journals. They argue that publicly funded information should not require gatekeeping and that the public should not have to pay again to learn from the research that they paid for to begin with. Open access publication allows information to flow freely to the most people. So you may ask, when traditional prestigious journals are beckoning for your work, why should you publish in an open access journal? You may choose this route because you want your research to have the widest audience possible. Sharing information under an open access license makes it free and therefore more accessible. And don't just think that this is a money issue. By sharing your work openly, you also enable others to translate it to other languages or remix the content in ways that more people can use. And ultimately, this can make your work have the widest impact. The numbers show that openly published articles generate as many or more citations than traditionally published articles held behind paywalls. Open Educational Resources, or OER, are openly licensed materials that are useful for teaching, learning, accessing, or for research. OER can make the classroom more accessible for students by making textbooks and other materials free for students to utilize. Utilizing truly open resources also allows the instructor to reuse, remix, revise, and redistribute materials freely and without reprisal from textbook companies. So why should you convert your class to OER? The primary reason that many faculty choose to explore OER is to make their class more economical for students to take. We all know that textbook prices seem to rise each year. A 2015 study of almost 5,000 students across multiple universities and community colleges demonstrated that students in OER classes were less likely to withdraw, were more likely to be enrolled in more classes, and were more likely to receive a passing grade than their peers in the control group, which were enrolled in classes using traditional textbooks. Students in today's economy often have to make difficult choices. Indeed, they may have to choose between buying a textbook for their class or having the money for gas to drive to that class. Finally, choosing OER can allow you to have greater flexibility with the information that you present to your class. We all know that it can be a pain to adopt a new edition of a book, and we often have to wait multiple semesters to make changes. With OER texts, outdated information can be easily adapted or corrected without the need to go through a traditional publisher. Like a bee depends on a flower to make its food, and the flowering tree depends on the bee to help it reproduce, Open access and open educational resources rely on each other in a symbiotic relationship. The ethos behind both concepts are the same. Information should be shared freely and widely. Open access creators need faculty to be willing to distribute their materials, and faculty, who are often open access creators themselves, 
need more creators to share their findings and work with open licenses to allow them to be used for open educational resources. So let's talk a bit more about what open licensing means and how you can join the Creative Commons movement. And that brings us to Creative Commons. Creative Commons is three things at the same time, a movement, a set of licenses, and an organization. Let's start with the story of Creative Commons as a movement. The battle between the internet and copyright in the U.S. came to a head in 1998 when Congress passed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. Yes, that's Sonny Bono. This act changed the rules governing the lifespan of a copyright. Previously, under the 1976 Copyright Act, copyright standardly lasted for the life of the creator plus 50 years, or for 75 years for an item under corporate authorship. The Sonny Bono Act extended creator copyright to 70 years, and it extended corporate copyright to 120 years. But back to our story. Enter Stanford Law Professor and Creative Commons founder Lawrence Lessig. Lessig felt that Congress continuing to change the rules to allow copyrights to never expire was unfair. He believed that new works needed to enter the public domain in order to encourage further creativity. Eric Eldridge agreed. Eldridge was the owner of an online site which reprinted works in the public domain. If no further works were allowed to enter the public domain, Eldred would endlessly find himself unable to publish any works written after the early 1920s. The internet had made so many out-of-print books available to audiences for the first time, and had made companies like Dover Publications, which offers cheap mass market copies of books originally published before the 1920s, available in print. By continually extending copyright protections, more and more titles would remain out of print and unable to be seen by increasing generations of people while estates and corporate bodies protected their own interests. Lessig represented Eldred in Eldred v. Ashcroft, which went to the Supreme Court in 2003. On one side were a host of book and music publishers. On the other, internationally known bodies like the Motion Picture Association of America and ASCAP. Eldred lost his case, but Creative Commons, the organization, was born. Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization with staff working around the world to promote the core ideals of Creative Commons, enabling the sharing of culture and knowledge. In 2002, the first Creative Commons licenses were made available. While creators still retain their copyright, Creative Commons licenses offered these creators more flexibility to grant certain rights to their work to the public to adapt and reuse their creations. Today, Creative Commons licenses have been applied to nearly 2 billion works across 9 million websites, and the numbers keep growing. And finally, Creative Commons is also a movement. The CC Global Network has over 600 members across 40 chapters around the world, and there's room in it for you too, if you believe in an open internet and accessibility for all. From Wikipedia editors to open source software supporters, the movement has a place for everyone. Copyright, as defined by the Oxford English Dictionary, is the exclusive right given by law for a certain term of years to an author, composer, designer, etc., or his assignee to print, publish, and sell copies of his original work. Copyright law can be and it is different for each country. However, copyright as a concept is quite simple. It protects your own rights to your own work and gives you a say in what happens or doesn't happen to that work. Copyright protects works that are original. That can include your article, your poem, your song, or your painting, and it can also include computer software and the blueprints to your home. Copyright in most countries begins when you write down, type, or record your work in a fixed medium. Merely having a thought or song lyrics in your head does not grant copyright. You have to write them down or record them for copyright law to kick into gear. And while most countries allow you to register your copyright with a federal office, that is merely for added protections. 
You own the copyright of all of your original creations, whether you ever pursue the more legal avenues or not. Copyright does allow for a few exceptions as well. Educational institutions, libraries, and reviewers make good use of the fair use clause, and persons with disabilities can have works reprinted or reformatted in ways that make them accessible. But what about the film Pride and Prejudice? Or the other film Pride and Prejudice? Or Bride and Prejudice? Or even Bridget Jones's Diary? Can they have copyright over their film even though it is based on Jane Austen's original work? In a word, yes. Copyright applies to the original work, but there is enough flexibility within it to allow for adaptations if those adaptations contribute enough original material. And while Focus Films may have copyright over their screenplay for the Kira Knightley-led version of Pride and Prejudice, Focus Features cannot claim a copyright over Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. In fact, no one can now claim copyright, at least in the U.S., over Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, or, as of this year, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, because these works were published before 1926 and are in the public domain. The public domain is where works go when copyrights can no longer be claimed over them, or works that have been purposely given to the public domain by their creators. Surprise, surprise, Creative Commons has a license for that. Now let's talk a bit about how you can make your work more open and about those Creative Commons licenses. There are six different types of Creative Commons licenses. These license options grant creators several options and levels of freedom that they want to allow future users with their work. Attribution is the most free Creative Commons license and only asks that future works give credit to the creator. Attribution, no derivatives, non-commercial licenses are the most restrictive in that they require credit to be given and also do not allow the work to be adapted or used for any commercial projects. If you are thinking about creating an OER, you should consider being as open as possible. After all, most users of open educational resources expect to be able to reuse, revise, reshare, and retain content. And so any non-derivatives license would make such a resource much less open. And maybe you've created something that you want to truly grant to the world as openly as possible. Perhaps you want to grant it to the public domain. While U.S. copyright doesn't necessarily allow you to forego the copyright that is inherent to your work from the moment of creation, Creative Commons has created a way for you to des designate that you wish for your work to be treated as public domain. CC0 allows creators to dedicate their work to the public domain and indicate that they wish for it to be treated as such. While this may not completely remove their legal copyright, since some countries do not allow you to forfeit your copyright, it allows the creator to indicate that they do wish to waive their rights. Be aware that the public domain mark, also seen here, has no legal bearing. It is merely a mark created by Creative Commons to indicate that a work is known to not have any copyright restrictions. If you choose to designate your work to the public domain, Make sure you select the CC0 mark, not the public domain mark. When you're ready to take the next step and publish open content or convert your class to open educational resources, please feel free to reach out to me, your friendly college librarian. I am happy to help you navigate open access journals, locate appropriate OER resources, and choose licenses for any content that you may create. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about how to open up your academic career, and we hope to see you in the library soon.